And finally, we have to recognize, as dr. King did, that progress can't just come from without. It also has to come from within. And over the past year, for example, we've made meaningful improvements in the field of education. I've got a terrific Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. He's been working hard with states and working hard with the D.C. school district. And we've insisted on reform, and we've insisted on accountability. We were putting in more money and we've provided more Pell Grants and more tuition tax. Credits and simpler financial aid forms. We've done all that, but parents still need to parent. Kids still need to own up to their responsibilities. We still have to set high expectations for our young people. Folks can't simply look to government for all the answers without also looking inside themselves. Inside their own homes, for some of the answers. Progress will only come if we're willing to promote that ethic of hard work. A sense of responsibility, in our own lives. I'm not talking, by the way, just to the African-American community. Sometimes when I say these things people ask me, well. He's just talking to black people about working hard. No, 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 no. I'm talking to the American community. Because somewhere along the way, we, as a nation, began to lose touch with some of our core values. You. Know what I'm talking about. We became enraptured with the false prophets who propheseized an easy path to success.
paved with credit cards and home equity loans and get-rich-quick schemes. And the most important thing was to be a celebrity, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you get on TV. That's everybody. We forgot what made the bus boycott a success, what made the civil rights movement a success. What made the United States of America a success that, in this country, there's no substitute for hard work. No substitute for a job well done, no substitute for being responsible stewards of God's blessings. What we're called to do, then, is rebuild America from its foundation on up. To reinvest in the essentials that we've neglected for too long like healthcare. Like education, like a better energy policy, like basic infrastructure, like scientific research. Our generation is called to buckle down and get back to basics. We must do so not only for ourselves, but also for our children, and their children. For Jordan and for Austin. That's a sacrifice that falls on us to make. It's a much smaller sacrifice than the Moses generation had to make, but it's still a sacrifice. Yes, it's hard to transition to a clean energy economy. Sometimes it may be inconvenient, but it's a sacrifice that we have to make. It's hard to be fiscally responsible when we have all these human needs. And we're inheriting enormous deficits and debt, but that's a sacrifice that we're going to have to make. You know, it's easy, after a hard day's work, to just put your kid in front of the TV set you're tired. Don't want to fuss with them instead of reading to them, but that's a sacrifice we must joyfully accept.
sometimes it's hard to be a good father and good mother. Sometimes it's hard to be a good neighbor, or a good citizen, to give up time in service of others. To give something of ourselves to a cause that's greater than ourselves as Michelle and I are urging. Folks to do tomorrow to honor and celebrate Dr. King. But these are sacrifices that we are called to make. These are sacrifices that our faith calls us to make. R. Faith in the future. Our faith in America. Our faith in God. And on his sermon all those years ago, Dr. King quoted a poet's verse. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. And behind the dim unknown stands God. within the shadows keeping watch above his own. Even as Dr. King stood in this church, a victory in the past and uncertainty in the future, he trusted God. He trusted that God would make a way. A way for prayers to be answered. A way for Our union to be perfected. A way for the arc of the moral universe, no matter how long. To slowly bend towards truth and bend towards freedom, to bend towards justice. He had faith that God would make a way out of no way. You know, Folks ask me sometimes why I look so calm. They say, all this stuff coming at you, how come you just seem calm? And I have a confession to make here. There are times where I'm not so calm. Reggie Love knows.
My wife knows. There are times when progress seems too slow. There are times when the words that are spoken about me hurt. There are times when the barbs sting. There are times when it feels like all these efforts are for naught. And change is so painfully slow in coming, and I have to confront my own doubts. But let me tell you during those times it's faith that keeps me calm. It's faith that gives me peace. The same faith that leads a single. Mother to work two jobs to put a roof over her head when she has doubts. The same faith that keeps an unemployed father to keep on submitting. Job applications even after he's been rejected a hundred times. The same faith that says to a teacher even if the first nine children she's teaching she can't reach. That that tenth one she's going to be able to reach. The same faith that breaks the silence of an earthquake's wake. With the sound of prayers and hymns sung by a Haitian community. A faith in things not seen, in better days ahead in him who holds the future in the hollow of his hand. A faith that lets us mount up on wings like eagles, lets us run and not be weary, lets us walk and not faint. So let us hold fast to that faith, as Joshua held fast to the faith of his fathers. And together, we shall overcome the challenges of a new age. Together, we shall seize the promise of this moment. Together, we shall make a way through winter. And we're going to welcome the spring. Through God all things are possible.
May the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King continue to inspire us and ennoble our world and all who inhabit it. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Barack Obama A more perfect union Delivered March 18, 2008, Philadelphia, PA Let me begin by thanking Harris Wofford for his contributions to this country. In so many different ways, he exemplifies what we mean by the word citizen. And so we are very grateful to him for all the work he has done. And I'm thankful for the gracious and thoughtful introduction. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Two hundred and twenty-one years ago, in a hall that still stands across the street. A group of men gathered and, with these simple words, launched America's improbable experiment in democracy. Farmers and scholars, statesmen and patriots who had traveled across the ocean. To escape tyranny and persecution finally made real their declaration of Independence at a Philadelphia convention that lasted through the spring of 1787. The document they produced was eventually signed, but ultimately unfinished. It was stained by this nation's original sin of slavery, a question that divided the colonies. And brought the convention to a stalemate until the founders chose to allow the slave trade to continue for at least 20 more years.
and to leave any final resolution to future generations. Of course, the answer to the slavery question was already embedded within our constitution. A constitution that had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law. A constitution that promised its people liberty and justice, and a union that could be and should be perfected over time. And yet words on a parchment would not be enough to deliver slaves from bondage. Or provide men and women of every color and creed their full rights and obligations as citizens of the United States. What would be needed were Americans in successive generations who were willing to do their part through protests and struggles. On the streets and in the courts, through a civil war and civil disobedience. and always at great risk to narrow that gap between the promise of our ideals and the reality of their time. This was one of the tasks we set forth at the beginning of this presidential campaign. To continue the long march of those who came before us, a march for a more just more equal, more free, more caring, and more prosperous America. I chose to run for president at this moment in history because I believe deeply that we cannot solve the challenges. Of our time unless we solve them together, unless we perfect our union by understanding that we may have different stories. But we hold common hopes, that we may not look the same and may not have come from the same place. But we all want to move in the same direction, towards a better future for our children and our grandchildren. And this belief comes from my unyielding faith in the decency and generosity of the American people. But it also comes from my own story.